Chapter 9 One of the happy memories of my life is the Rose Ball which Enoch and I gave in Weisendorf in 1928. We wished this to be an outstanding occasion, so we made careful and elaborate plans by which the old castle were transformed into a veritable fairyland. The rooms were lighted with hundreds of candles, and everywhere were massed quantities of deep red roses. Among the guests was the Duke of Schwarzenberg and his daughters. The Schwarzenberg family usually lived in Czechoslovakia, but at that time they were staying at Castle Schwarzenberg, near Scheinfeld, which was about 30 miles from Weisendorf. My interest was aroused by the youngest of the daughters, Teresa, who was dark-haired with large expressive eyes and a clear, bright colouring. Everyone was enchanted with her, but particularly Karl Ludwig. His interest was so marked that there were soon smiles and whispered words. Did you see Karl Ludwig and Teresa Schwarzenberg? Look at Teresa and Karl Ludwig. This meeting at our Rose Ball was the beginning of their love. Shortly after that, Enoch and I were invited to go with Karl Ludwig to pay a formal visit to the splendid home of the Schwarzenberg family, Castle Frauenberg in Czechoslovakia. The young couple became engaged and Enoch and I were delighted that our brother had found so charming and suitable a wife. During the years of 1928 to 1929, everyone seemed to breathe a deep sigh of relief. There was a feeling of hope and security. Germany was making progress toward real stability. At the time, no one realised that the new prosperity stood on the unstable foundation of credit inflation. In the late fall, we were on a holiday trip, hunting chamas in the Austrian Alps. Usually, when we made such trips, Enoch's little dog, Schlupf, accompanied us. This time, Schlupf did not seem well, and Enoch did not wish to take him into the high snows. We had scarcely reached our destination when a wire came from Gutenberg telling him that little Schlupf was dead. Enoch wept like a child, not only for the loss of the devoted pet, but because we had not been there to comfort the faithful animal when it was dying. Enoch asked me not to mention the little dog when other members of the hunting party were present, for fear that he might show his tears. He was so upset over the loss of Schlupp that after some months I had several wire-haired Dachshunds sent a sample so that I could choose one to present to Enoch on his birthday. The first puppy to scramble from the box was a funny little black and tan fellow, which seemed actually to be smiling and showing all his small white teeth. I chose him, and Enoch named him Putzel. Soon, Putzel was his master's shadow. One place which we never tired of visiting was Jettingen, the home of Clemens and Elizabeth Stauenberg. It was in a very fine farming country between Augsburg and Ulm. This section was laced with rivers and streams and was almost entirely devoted to the raising of grain, cattle and dairying. Jettingen itself was a big square castle with the ever-present towers. It was a house filled with sunshine and furnished in the exquisite good taste that would naturally be expected of Elizabeth Stauenberg. To be with Elizabeth was always a great joy for me. Although she was older than I, from the first day we had met, there had been a close bond between us. With her sensitive, intuitive nature, she was one of the few people who understood the almost aching depth of love between Enoch and myself. There was a marked resemblance in appearance between Elizabeth and Enoch and a deep affection. Clemens was a kind, quiet man and a skilled and very successful farmer. To me, he always seemed to be restrained, particularly when he was in his father's home in Greifenstein. Perhaps it was the disadvantage of being the rather delicate son of so vital and commanding a father as Count Berthold. Early in the spring of 1929, I was expecting our fourth child and felt the need of a change of scene, 
so I persuaded Enoch to take me to Jettingen. This time our two boys went with us. They were always eager to visit their cousins, and when we were there, the household was in a constant uproar of youthful excitement. Elizabeth Stavenberg was deeply attached to her children. One could feel the warm affection between them. On our arrival this time, we saw the new baby son, Otto Philip. Marie Gabrielle, the eldest child, had grown into quite a young lady, as she was now sixteen. Karl Berthold, who was eleven, had been the baby I had gone to see in Munich in 1919. That was the momentous day on which I had met Elizabeth for the first time and become engaged to Enoch. Karl Berthold was his grandfather's namesake and heir. After Clemens, he would be head of the schenk Stauenberg family. He was just a little too old to condescend to play with the small children, our two boys, who were seven and eight, and his seven-year-old brother, Marcard. Marcard was a quiet, serious child who would spend hours drawing boats and houses. At that time, he was trying to make up his mind whether he would be an admiral or an architect. He usually had to be coaxed by our tirelessly exuberant boys into climbing trees and indulging in strenuous outdoor games. Much to our regret, we were obliged all too soon to return home for the approaching marriage of Karl Ludwig and Teresa Schwarzenberg, which was to be a very elaborate affair. Karl Ludwig and Teresa Princess Schwarzenberg were married at Castle Schwarzenberg in April 1929. Our two sons and little Nivis, in a long white lace dress, were members of the bridal party, and Enoch also played a part in the beautiful wedding, taking the place of Karl Ludwig's father as head of the family. I was very much in the background, attending only the ceremony in the church and keeping myself well hidden from sight. At any hour, I was expecting our fourth child. Our youngest daughter, Teresa Benedicta, was born on a May morning in Gutenberg Castle. She was a beautiful child and the centre of all interest during that summer when we were so happily united as a family. The young Karl Ludwigs, as we called them, were soon established in the castle of the Salzburg near our small spa of Neuhaus. Most of the enormous castle was in ruins, but Enoch gave the habitable wing to Karl Ludwig as a wedding gift. The Salzburg, high on its promontory above the river Saal, was a most romantic and historic place, and Teresa, Karl Ludwig's wife, had studied archaeology, so she thoroughly loved and appreciated its interesting past. Later, Karl Ludwig bought the entire compound of the Berg from Enoch and made extensive restorations. These restorations were a superb work of art, for they very carefully preserved its ancient style and rugged character. The rooms with their Byzantine fireplaces and the picturesque stone windows made a suitable background for the Karl Ludwig's fine collection of antiques. Also, added to the Salzburg was the comforts of modern civilization, central heating, running water and other conveniences. The young couple drew around them in the Salzburg a very interesting group of friends. Karl Ludwig had taken his doctorate in history and was deeply interested in the philosophy of history as well as in politics. Enoch and I often visited in the Salzburg and there we met people of national and international consequence, people of the highest intellect to whom the spiritual values of life were of the utmost importance. Those visits were for us always an inspiring experience. Karl Ludwig and Teresa had two daughters, Lilo, Elizabeth, and Toda, Theodora, and not until some years later was a son born, named Johann, for his grandfather the Duke of Schwarzenberg. The life of Teresa Gutenberg, to a great extent, followed the pattern of my own. It was filled with the same long separations, while Karl Ludwig worked tirelessly, just as Enoch did, for the political development of his country. 
But Teresa also had many of the same deep joys that filled my own life. We decided that the time had come for the two boys to be sent away to a Jesuit school in Austria. It was a difficult decision for me to make because until their education was completed, they would come home only for a brief summer holiday. At first, the house seemed strangely silent without their exuberant activities. Fortunately, this was a period when Enoch could spend more time at home with me and our small daughters. He had a wonderful capacity for enjoying every moment of these weeks at home. There were walks through the woods, hunting, fishing in the countless streams around Gutenberg. He enjoyed evenings in the library, studying his fine collections of art books, and last, but very important, the company of friends. Just before Christmas, we would usually go to Weisendorf for small game hunting. The house lent itself beautifully to these festive gatherings. When there was good snow, the guests, sometimes as many as thirty, would arrive from neighbouring estates in sleighs while wrapped in furs. Old Count Berthold Stauenberg was the guest of honour and always at my side. He was a magnificent shot and everyone considered it a privilege to hunt with him. During the day, we would roam through the snow-covered fields and woods. At twilight, the hunters would return, and after a short rest, everyone would reappear, glamorous in evening clothes. There would be good food and wine, later dancing and games. On these occasions, Enoch was as happy as a boy, entering into the gaiety with all his heart. I loved those hunting parties too, because they reminded me of Hungary, my second homeland. Soon after the hunting in Weisendorf, almost the same group of friends would meet again in Greifenstein to hunt Count Berthold's hares. The hunting days in Greifenstein were always the highlight of our social life. The days were spent in the snow-covered woods around the castle, and in the evenings in the armoury hall with its high vaulted ceiling and great roaring fire. Count Berthold was a perfect host, for he had the rare ability of being able to give pleasure to all of those around him. Elizabeth and Clemens Stauenberg were always present on those happy occasions, and usually Count Berthold's brother Alfred, whom everyone loved. With Count Alfred were often his twin sons, young Berthold and Alexander. And it was at a hunting party in Greifenstein that I first met Alfred's son, Klaus Stauenberg, who years later was to be a historic character because of his attempt to destroy Hitler. Klaus, at the time of these hunting parties, was a brilliant and promising young officer who had chosen the army as a career. He was tall like all the Stauenbergs, strikingly handsome, with black hair and very dark brown eyes, and a curious mannerism of holding his head bent forward as of listening to some important message. Somehow, it seemed strange that Klaus chose a military career, for he possessed spiritual qualities which were well expressed in his love of poetry and art. He was one of the few persons taken into close friendship by the great German poet, Stefan George. His voice was soft and cultured. He was, indeed, a very personable young man. He was also a very fine soldier, for he was later honoured as the most outstanding German officer. I cannot understand how some historians have pictured Klaus Stauenberg as a physically big, powerful person, giving an impression that he was a man possessed of great brute force. This certainly was not the case. When I first met Klaus and Greifenstein, he was quite young, just embarking on his brilliant career, and it was a number of years later that he married Baroness Nina Leisenfeid. Karl Ludwig, Theresa, young Berthold, and Alexander and Klaus were near of an age and always lent youthful enthusiasm to our hunting parties. Every night after the women had retired, the men would go for long political discussions to Count Berthold's private study. In this study, Berthold's desk was always near collapse 
with piles of papers, files and countless personal photographs heaped on it. In a haze of cigar smoke, the men would often talk until dawn. Count Berthold was one of the men anxious for the restoration of the monarchy in Bavaria as the only solution for its complex political problems. He was most helpful with his wisdom and advice. The apparent improvement of conditions in Germany was short-lived. The introduction of foreign capital for a time was like a transfusion which kept the heart of industry beating. The Dawes plan proved to be too great a strain on the staggering economy, and something had to be found to take its place. Finally, the young plan emerged, taking its name from its originator, the American financial expert Owen D. Young. It still imposed a heavy burden on Germany, but the payments of reparations extended over a long period of years, and for the time being, some of the pressure would be eased. When the young plan was made public, there was a storm of protest in Germany. Nationalists as well as national socialists violently opposed its adoption, fearing that conditions might improve and this would interfere with their own aims. Gustav Stressemann worked as conscientiously and tirelessly for the Young Plan as he had for the Dawes Plan. He still hoped to have a part in a serious move toward general disarmament and some lasting international unity. But three months before the adoption of the Young Plan, he died. He was worn out by his thankless efforts in behalf of his country. If Gustav Stressemann had lived, perhaps Germany and Europe might have been spared the Nazi horror. Up to the end of 1929, it was a good year. Experts who visited Germany were convinced that the country was on a road to recovery. But unfortunately, the financial crisis in the United States in the fall of 1929 was quickly reflected in Germany, where the wheels of industry ground to a halt. Nothing could stem the approaching disaster. The Great Depression of 1930 made the chaos in 1923 of little consequence by comparison. The Bruning government asked the people to eat less, pay more taxes to meet unemployment benefits and to accept drastic cuts in salary. It was a vicious circle. Nothing made any sense. Chaos again gripped Germany and millions were unemployed. The communists were sure that the Soviet was the answer Many joined the Communist Party, but more turned to National Socialism. To the German people, facing further national humiliation and in a country literally falling apart, Hitler loomed as a messiah. The German people longed for a leader, someone who would restore not only their national, but their personal pride. What they wanted was a leader who would shout down the talk of war guilt, treaties and reparations. In that crucial moment, Hitler seemed to be the answer. Chancellor Bruning, himself a financial expert, saw everything from the standpoint of finance and international relations. He was confident that if the country's financial structure became sound, national socialism would cease to be a serious threat. The Bruning government was so engrossed in finance that the lawlessness and aggression of the Nazi party for a long time went unchecked. The Nazi party had been banned in Berlin in 1927, but it was again flourishing. The SA and SS troops of Hitler began to stage bloody riots against the communists and the Jews. Everyone was shocked when the Reichstag elections in September 1930 swept the National Socialists into second place. The same month, Hitler took supreme command of the SA and SS, which had by that time been developed into a highly trained organization of over 100,000 men. In 1931, Hitler called his friend Ernst Rem back from Bolivia, where he had gone as military advisor. He made Rem chief of staff of the SA and SS. Although there was always great rivalry between the old SA and the younger SS, they were now unified under Rem's command. The development of the SS is most complex and difficult to unravel. 
After the death of Rem in 1934, all forms of political police were unified under the supreme command of Heinrich Himmler and his assistant, probably two of the most ruthless and cruel of Hitler's men. Himmler used the SS not only to carry out police functions, but added many special categories within the SS. One of them was the Totenkopf, which executed Himmler's hideous crimes, though his main organization in the secret police was the SD, Reich Sicherheitsdienst. To complicate things still further, Hermann Göring, determined to have a uniformed force of his own, established the Waffen SS. This group was formed out of the SS bodyguards, the superb physical specimens who were the core of Hitler's personal army. Hitler and his advisers knew that they could not count on the Wehrmacht for full support because there was a large percentage of the army which still stood stanchly by the old traditions and could never be won over to Nazism. For this reason, the Waffen SS filled a vital need for a full-blooded Nazi army, which, at the proper moment, could be incorporated into the structure of the Wehrmacht. There is a mistaken idea that all of the SS were members of the cruel Nazi secret police. However, that was not the case. For while Himmler used certain divisions of the SS to carry out his brutal crimes, he frequently chose outstanding and influential men to be the recipients of honorary degrees in his SS ranks. In addition, there were also more or less harmless soldiers in the Waffen SS, so that this corps contained two extreme types of men. Again, a presidential election loomed in the midst of chaos. The unemployed had reached four million. Reich President von Hindenburg intended to run again. And this time it was Hitler who was to run against the field marshal. But there was a problem. Adolf Hitler was not a German citizen. It is an astonishing fact that all through the years he had made no effort to become naturalized. Any candidate for the presidency had to be a citizen. A law existed by which any alien appointed to a civil office, state or federal, automatically became a citizen. The state of Brunswick obligingly appointed Hitler to an official state position and this gave him the necessary citizenship. But in spite of his efforts, Reich President von Hindenburg was re-elected. After that there followed a seesaw of events. Bruning and his cabinet were dismissed. Because of mounting bloodshed and riots, the SA and SS were ordered disbanded in April but were ironically legalized again in June. Von Papen became Chancellor, and there soon followed his abortive coup, when by presidential decree he had himself appointed Reich Commissar of Prussia. This was a violation of the Constitution and a serious breakdown of state structure. The parliamentary system had proved itself incapable of solving Germany's problems. Hitler was growing arrogant, on top of this, the continued lawlessness of the individual Nazi in taking vengeance against his personal enemies was getting out of hand. There was a growing feeling that the Weimar Republic was doomed. Again, people in Bavaria talked openly of a king. <laughs>